Allow me then just to say a little bit about Angelie Dallal Clayton before she gives us her paper. It's been a great pleasure working with Angelie over the period of um, Black Arts and Modernism Project. As you probably can see from the way in which this um, day has been organized, Anjali is not shy of detail. <laughs> Her mind is forensic in its analysis, and she leaves no stone unturned in her relentless pursuit of historical veracity. I've learned a lot from Anjali in relation to a certain kind of uh, need for historical rigor, because sometimes mine can slip, I must admit. Um, and in her training as an art historian, I think that very much comes, comes to the fore. Angelie's postdoctoral research fellow on the project Black Artists and Modernism, as many of you will know, her doctoral work, or at least part of her doctoral work, made use of those skills in relation to generating an in-depth history of the Blue Coats' work with black artists to date. She continues that interest in relation to this paper that she present for us when she gives us, a, as I said, a return to that exhibition, Black Skin, Blue Coat. So with no further ado, please join me in welcoming Angie Dallapay. So for the past five years, I've been researching and writing about an exhibition that took place here at the Blue Coat in 1985, titled Black Skin, Blue Coat. It was a small group exhibition displaying work by Sonia Boyce, Eddie Chambers, Tam Joseph and Keith Piper and was the first here to present work by artists describing themselves as both black and British. Until now, my research of the show has focused on how it was organised and there's a video online of a paper I gave in 2012 discussing the curatorial strategies of the exhibition and how it impacted the Blue Coats programme in the following years. And I'll cover some of that ground today, um, but I'll also briefly consider some of the artworks that were shown in it and share with you my initial thoughts as to how we might arrive at a new conception of it through and in relation to those artworks. Um, okay. So the story of how the exhibition came about more or less starts in 1984 after the Blue Coats artistic director Brian Biggs saw the exhibition Black Art Now at the Black Art Gallery in London and into the open at the Mappin Gallery, Mappin Gallery in Sheffield. Both exhibitions made a strong impact on him. The first brought to his attention the existence of black British artists engaged in a specific practice of raising black consciousness and contesting racial oppression. The second was the first large survey of work by artists of African and Asian descent, either born or raised in Britain, uh, or based in Britain rather, um, to be staged in a major municipal gallery. It demonstrated both the profusion of these artists at a time when the public and even gallery staff were largely ignorant of their existence, uh, and also the breadth of practices they were engaged in. In a context of high unemployment, the collapse of industry, the rise of the far right and racial tension that for many characterized uh, early 80s Britain, Biggs was struck by the way the content of the work in these shows resonated with the times. The currency and sense of urgency they conveyed needed to be seen at the blue coat. So Biggs contacted Keith Piper. Uh, an artist whose work was in both shows about participating in an exhibition at the Blue Coat. When Piper responded, he explained that a large group show of works by only black artists was not particularly enticing. He stated, there's limited mileage in collectivizing and exhibiting the work of individuals linked by no other factor beyond the color of their skin. I don't feel that it should be out of the question for black artists of the obvious strength and quality of many of the contributors to into the into the open to all be offered solo shows both here at your gallery and elsewhere. Indeed, numerous black artists had exhibited in black group shows by this point of the 1980s and were now keen to avoid the racial context provided by that curatorial format by exhibiting in solo shows that could foster a deeper understanding of their individual practices and concerns. At the Blue Coat, however, um, one person shows were reserved for uh, more established artists whose quantity of works could fill the entire gallery space and for whose work there was also an existing discourse to justify it. 
Biggs therefore replied by stating or suggesting that a small group show uh, might meet the requirement of filling the space whilst also providing a focus on the practices of each artist due to the layout of the gallery. He explained that the nature of our space here makes it possible to feature in one exhibition a more substantial body of work by a number of artists displayed separately in each of the four rooms. And that's how Black Skin Blue Coat was devised. In Gallery 1 were four works on paper by Sonia Boyce. Gallery 2 was devoted to a slide-based work um, by Keith Piper, which needed to be shown alone in a darkened space. This meant that the second of the two works he showed in the exhibition had to be placed in Gallery 1 alongside Boyce's works. In Gallery 3, there were seven artworks by Tam Joseph, which were a mixture of paintings and sculpture. And finally, a large collage by Chambers was shown in Gallery 4. And these are two installation shots um, from that show. And you can, so on the left, you can see um, three works by Tam Joseph, and on the right, um, the collage by Eddie Chambers, which I will talk, talk about in a minute. A catalogue wasn't produced for Black Skin Blue Coat. However, Chambers wrote the text for an accompanying leaflet clarifying the exhibition's premise. In it, he asserted that the artists wanted their work, and I quote, uh, wanted their work to contribute to the vital process of consciousness raising and politicization of black people, and that the exhibition was an attempt to establish a positive and mutually beneficial dialogue between Liverpool's black communities and one of the city's most important gallery spaces. For although the artists were based in London and Bristol, Issues of racism and oppression provided a common bond between the four artists and black Liverpudlians. There were no significant reviews in the press, but positive responses in the visitor's book indicated that the exhibition was well received by local audiences and that the inclusion of black artists in the Blue Coats program was highly welcomed. That said, some black artists from the Liverpool area were agitated by the fact that the Bluecoats' first major engagement with black British artists was with artists based in London and Bristol, but not Liverpool. But that's another story. In terms of how we might now remember or perceive the exhibition, it's important to consider the content of the work and its relevance to the socio-political milieu to consider that it, that's what had prompted individuals such as Biggs and indeed others to display it. That is, it was more common for individuals and institutions to look to discourses outside of art for reasons to champion the work of black artists than it was to see their work as part of a longer art historical lineage or as advancing contemporary debates about art. This, combined with the fact that the artworks in Black Skin Blue Coat did indeed speak to a variety of what were then current affairs, and that the artists themselves presented the exhibition as being motivated by socio-political concerns, meant that the media, style and art historical position of the artworks were likely to have been overlooked in the public reception of the exhibition. Thirty years on, our memory and understanding of Black Skin Blue Coat may be skewed by the way it was curated, contextualised and received. That is, we may simply recall that it was a black group show in which questions of race, representation and identity politics were explored. I don't need to explain the limitations of such an understanding uh, and, and what impact that might have on the artists involved, and moreover in our understanding of black British exhibition histories. So I ask, what happens to our understanding and memory of an exhibition if we examine the artworks closely in terms of medium style and broader art historical context or lineage. For the remainder of this paper, I'd like to share with you the beginnings of such an experiment, drawing attention to the way in which black skin blue, the black skin blue coat artist combined image and text, utilized a collage aesthetic, and insisted on representational or referential practices that in turn can help us recognize the exhibition as part of a 1980s avant-garde. Black skin blue coat began with four works on paper by Sonia Boyce. In these figurative works, she combined pastel, chalk, gouache, and pencil to depict individuals in domestic and other interior settings. At the start of her art education, Boyce had been influenced by the multimedia practices of the Phoenix Feminist Art Collective, and she often collaged found images with her own drawings as part of an issue-based feminist art practice. 
However, in the first year of her degree at Stourbridge, she found that issue-based work was discouraged by the fine art department, while formal and abstract practices were highly favoured. Fearing marginalisation as a consequence of her choice of style, she spent her second year drawing, painting and producing highly formal works whilst keeping a journal in which she formulated ideas that she felt inhib inhibited from exploring in her actual artworks. During this time, she encountered the work of Susan Hiller, whose issue-based work, exploration of everyday subject matter and combination of image and text helped Boyce to consider how she might bring seemingly, several seemingly disparate elements together in single artworks. At around the same time, she became involved with the activities of the Black Art Group, whose issue-based work um, and highly referential work countered art school orthodoxy at the time. In her third year, she decided to reject the restraints of her art school and began making the work she wanted to, the eventual result of which can be seen in the work shown in Black Skin Blue Coat. They were representational, issue-based and integrated sources from her personal and everyday experience. Auntie Enid, the pose, which you can see here, is a portrait that incorporates a wide range of sources, including a black and white studio photo of the artist aunt, furniture and patterns from, fa uh, from her family home, and patterns from wallpaper samples. Combining these sources with gouache and pastel and oil stick drawing, she created a portrait that referenced the 1960s and the processes of self-fashioning that took place in the photographer's studio. In Missionary Position 2, um, I should just say all the works I'm talking about are, were in black skin blue coat, okay, not, not other ones. So... In Missionary Position 2, Boyce used watercolour, pastel and crayon on paper to create a self-portrait that directly referenced Frida Kahlo's The Two Fridas. As with Auntie Enid the pose, she looked to the interiors of her family home for patterns, furniture and ornaments with which she could populate the background of this artwork. In it, we see the incorporation of the kind of text she had been keeping in her journals. The title of the work is presented at the top, um, just below the cross, or just there, and, um, and running along the bottom in narrativizing comic strip style is a set of assertions regarding the entanglement of religion and politics. One of the most interesting aspects of big women's talk, which you can see here, is the use of pattern, both in the background and the foreground, and that the patterns are all completely flat. There's no shading to indicate the shape of the woman's body, yet the bold curves within the pattern of her dress, which is a direct reference to the sculptures of Nikki de saint Fal, give the illusion of undulating fabric. This playing with flatness suggests a willingness to engage with the formalist preferences of her art school and Greenbergian prescriptions for modern, for modern painting, yet the referential nature of her work, her use of pattern and depiction of kitsch domestic interiors worked against them. A simultaneous engagement with and rejection of the tenets of modernist art can also be found in Keith Piper's work. At secondary school, he became interested in the post-impressionist idea that art didn't have to be representative, and also in the collages of Robert Rauschenberg. This was reflected in his practice as it developed during his foundation year, in his combination of text, photography and found objects to produce uh, conceptual works and temporary sculptures. At around the same time, he became involved with Eddie Chambers, who was committed to the idea of art as having a social role, particularly in relation to raising black consciousness. As a consequence of his collaboration with Chambers, Piper's inclusion of text in his artworks took a turn away from the conceptual to having a particular communicative purpose. Text and image were no longer combined in a structural linguistic tradition of exploring arbitrary arbitrary relationships of meaning between words and, and uh, images, but instead in order to have an illustrative and meaningful impact on the viewer. Although by the time the exhibition Black Skin Blue Coat took place, Piper wasn't collaborating with Chambers as such, his interest in combining text and image for, the specific, for specific communicative effect remained present in the collage and time-based works in that show. The Seven Rages of Man, which you can see on a panel of on the left, uh, comprised seven busts with a cast of the artist's head set against a montage of text and photocopied uh, images pasted on sugar paper, which were then covered in plastic. 
Each of the seven parts represented a black man in a different stage of existence in history, including pre-colonial Africa, the Middle Passage, the era of the American slave plantation, post-war migration to Britain from the colonies, early 1980s Britain, and in an imagined future in a united socialist Africa. Piper developed the work out of his dual interest in exploring how we perceive history and in building a narrative in an artwork that could give a sense of historical continuity. In this piece, and inspired by the pan-Africanist notion of I be we, he explored how historical and global struggles could be expressed as personal struggles. Text played a pivotal role in this, presenting a personal narrative in each part that simultaneously conveyed a much longer global history across the entire piece. As he explained to me at interview, although he'd been discouraged from including text in his artworks during his studies on the basis that viewers would not read it, he was adamant that including text could have an important function for viewers, not only in expressing specific or prescriptive messages, but also in carrying a narrative. Narrative and the combination of text and image were similarly central to the Trophies of Empire, the other work that he showed in Black Skin Blue Coat. This multimedia installation comprised three floor-to-ceiling banners. The first was a title piece with the Trophies of Empire written on it and a pencil drawing of a national front march. The second depicted a black youth with some text relating to colony, although... Uh, Piper explained to me that he can't really recall exactly what was written on it. Um, and the third showed a policeman. These banners acted as a framing device for the rest of the installation. In front of the banners was a sculptural piece comprising uh, two packing, packing crates for tea. On top of the crates was a mould of the artist's head with a sound element. And visitors would walk around this and the banners to enter a darkened gallery space in which there was a two carousel tape slide projection with um, a cycle of images that was projected onto a pre existing curved wall. Many of the slides combined found images and text, which Piper applied directly onto the slides using Letraset. Bearing in mind that video technology was not easily accessible to artists at the time, this allowed him to transfer his practice of combining text and image on wall-based works to a time-based work, one that could unfold a narrative over time. Because of the slide carousels, he was able to present a cyclical narrative without a beginning or end. With reference to the 1982 book, The Empire Strikes, the Empire Strikes Back, co-authored by Paul Gilroy, the slides related to British imperial history and the cyclical nature of historical events and progressions. So, like the Seven Rages of Man, the Trophies of Empire utilised text and image to articulate a historical narrative. For Sonia Boyce, in her work Missionary Position 2, text provided a voice for the image, enabling the image to take on a particular set of significances relating to religion and politics and the entanglement of the two in one, um, in one person's experience. Handwritten text played a similar role in Tam Joseph's UK school reports. This acrylic on canvas work comprised three portraits of a young man in his passage through underachievement and disaffection at school. The text beneath each of the portraits summarise his teachers and indeed British societal evaluations of him, giving clear indication of the racist, racist stereotypes imposed on young black men. The text not only guides the viewer towards an appreciation of the work's content, but it also provides a narrative arc that is both personal and political for the individual depicted. I've never had a chance to see Eddie Chambers' Alabama Night Moves, the Marlborough Connection, up close, nor speak with him about it. There's no scholarship on it, and this installation shot is the only image of it that I've found. From this, however, we can work out that it's a collage comprising found images of lynchings, slaves, the plan of a slave ship, a dollar bill, and a torn up US flag. Text is incorporated in the form of book pages, newspaper cuttings, and other printed sources. Among the texts is a line from Ijeman Levi's 1982 record, Tell It to the Children, and a quote from Karl Marx's Das Kapital. As if Chambers' ex explication of the causal link between slavery in the Americas and capitalism was not clear enough, a large red spray-painted arrow underscores his point. Thus, like Piper's work in the same exhibition, this work addresses history through a powerful combination of text and image with a narrative element. 
Having considered some of the works in black skin blue coat, albeit in a cursory fashion, how might we reconsider the practices of the four artists involved and indeed the exhibition as a whole? Rather than seeing the works together as exemplars of an incendiary and confrontational movement that espoused a politicized aesthetic in relation to issues of race, as they may, might have been understood at the time, I suggest that the artist's use of collage, combination of image and text, in developing narratives within their artworks and their joint insistence on a representational practice provide an indication of how we might now conceive the exhibition. Although some of the artists notionally rejected modernism as a critical framework because of its prescriptions for non-referential, apolitical or ahistorical expression, the collages of Piper and Chambers and indeed the multiplicity of media and reference points found in Boyce and Joseph's works that one might describe as a collage aesthetic positions them in a much longer lineage of artists that have used collage as part of a socially engaged practice. One might therefore claim that their works were created in the modernist tradition of appropriating and reworking on the level of the image the resources of the culture at large that can also be found in, for example, Picasso's collages and those of the Dadaists who used collage in their opposition of the status quo. Indeed, it was those same early modernists, Cubists, Futurists, Dadaists and so on, that began incorporating text into their artworks. For example, typography entered the work of Kurt Schwitters in his exploration of the arbitrariness of linguistic signs. Text also appeared in pop art as part of the depiction of a recognisable mass disseminated imagery that offered a legibility to the viewer that abstract expressionism had refused. And text also became a defining feature in early conceptual art and particularly in the artworks of the group Art and Language, which had developed from a disillusionment with modernist painting and was critical of modernism in general for its bureaucracy and of the formalist and non-referential positions of individuals such as Clement Greenberg and Michael Fried. For me, the artworks in Black Skin, Blue Coat sit somewhere in this story. While early conceptual artists used text to explore how an idea could be implemented conceptually through language rather than perceptually through vision, my understanding is that the black skin blue coat artists were testing the narrative capabilities of text in combination with image to convey, expose and contest ideas and ideologies. As such, and despite this crucial difference in objective, the artworks are relatable to pop and conceptual art in terms of their disruption of the formalist space of art through the inclusion of text and in terms of their highly representational or referential nature. Now, I feel nervous about contextualising the work in this way, as Piper reminded me at interview that he and Chambers had not been especially engaged in, art, uh, in the history of art or in positioning their work in relation to it, and that their practices were more influenced by late 1970s and early 80s pop culture. He cites the kinds of al uh, album covers that were being designed by graphic artists Jamie Reed and Neville Brody and posters that were produced for Rock Against Racism as particular influences. <coughs> as such, some of the works in Black Skin, Blue Coat were absolutely part of and even constitutive of the broader zeitgeist. However, that those graphic artists were influenced by modernist developments in art, including pop, nonetheless positions Piper and Chambers as being in dialogue with or as having a relationship to those practices. I'm, of course, cautious about suggesting influences sometimes because there's a danger of suggesting derivation rather than innovation. But my interest in at least noting possible lineages or art historical relationships existing within the artworks themselves is to consider how these artists, and by extension the exhibition, spoke to or challenged other artists' artworks and practices. By elucidating whom or what the artworks in Black Skin Blue Coat, Blue Coat spoke to or challenged, we can be begin the task of formulating an alternative conception of the exhibition or as I have described it in the title of this paper, recognising or recognising black skin blue coat. For me, black skin blue coat was diametrically engaged in modernism as criticism, yet directly engaged in modernist artistic practices as su um, and as such was part of the broader critical response to modernism that occurred in pop conceptualism and other similar artistic developments, um, whilst being simultaneously embedded in the cultural spirit of the time. From there, we might then consider how the exhibition spoke to and sat alongside other similar exhibitions of the time that didn't necessarily involve black artists. But that's for another day. Thanks.